Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Mount Olive. So glad you could join us for worship this morning. Today we continue our Easter celebration focusing on uh, a line in a, in a verse of the famous hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. It's a, it's a line that you've sung many times, I have no doubt, um, a line that you've heard many times, but maybe a line that you haven't given a ton of thought to. It's at the end of verse 4. It says, He lives to hear my soul's complaint. Maybe that sounds a little strange to you at, at first. Our Old Testament lesson from the book of Lamentations will serve as the focus for our sermon today. And as we go through that, that, that text from Lamentations chapter 3, my hope is that you'll better understand what the, the writer of I Know That My Redeemer Lives meant when he said, He lives to hear my soul's complaint. With that, Lord's blessings to you on your worship this morning. We'll begin with our opening hymn. Lord, to you I make confession.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In His great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us approach Him with humble confidence to confess our sins and seek His forgiveness. God, my heavenly Father, I know that You are just and true. I confess that I have found pleasure in what perishes, sought joy in what spoils, and have put faith in what fades away, rather than the rock-solid truth of your word. I have not always believed, but have fallen into doubt of your great promises. Teach me to see with the eyes of faith your pierced hands and feet and wounded side. Lead me to believe the witnesses of your resurrection Forgive me my sins, shield me by your power, and prove my faith genuine to your praise and glory. Jesus Christ is the judge of the living and the dead. Men killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen by many witnesses. He has sent his Holy Spirit and promises his church If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. Amen. We join together in praising the God who forgives our sins with the Gloria. O God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for this morning comes from the Gospel of John. Jesus gives us an incredible reminder that grief on this earth will turn into eternal joy. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 16. 
in a little while you will see me no more. And then, after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. This is the gospel of our Lord. We continue with the singing of Psalm 50. Proclaim is right. 
In our second reading, we're, we're reminded that we are strangers here, aliens, foreigners in this world, that this place is not our home. Jesus means that we have an eternal home waiting for us in heaven. And yet, while we're here, there's encouragement to respect those in authority over us. A reading from 1 Peter chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves, for the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. This too is the word of our God. We join together in a song, Keep Your Mind on Jesus. There's a sense of calm and soothing peace that comes when you keep your thoughts on the things above. Just let go of all the anxiousness and keep your mind on Jesus.
Morning, kids. Hope you're doing well today. Today we're talking about complaining. Now, I know that you guys don't know anything about complaining, so I wanted to take a few minutes to help you better understand what complaining is. I'm joking. I'm a dad. I know that you guys understand what complaining is. You probably do it all the time, and I'm I'm sadly right there with you. You know, it's not just kids who complain. I think we all complain from time to time. We're not satisfied with what we have in this life, and we like to tell other people about that, that truth, that we're not satisfied. You know, I think if, if we don't give it much thought, we probably assume as Christians that complaining is always wrong. But that's not necessarily the case. We're going to talk about two different ways to complain today. One is definitely sinful. One, one is not the first way that, that someone might complain is with the belief that Jesus is, is dead. That there was a real person named Jesus who lived and died, sure, but he didn't rise from the dead. If someone believes that Jesus did not rise from the dead, the, the Bible says that their faith is futile. They don't have any forgiveness of sins if they reject the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So if you're living life like Jesus is dead and in the grave, that then complaining is sinful. You have no hope. You're complaining, you're not satisfied with this life, and nothing's ever going to change because you don't have forgiveness of sins and peace with God. You don't have heaven. But, but for the Christian, when we complain, when we express the fact that we're not satisfied with this life, but do so believing very much that Jesus was crucified for our sins and rose from the dead... That means that we know this world is not all that there is. That death here is not the end, but rather the beginning of eternal life with our God in heaven. Because Jesus is not dead, but alive. Our sins are forgiven and he's preparing a place for us in heaven. You see, when we complain here on earth, but we do so knowing that Jesus is getting heaven ready for you and me, it's kind of like us saying, I don't really like this life. I'm not happy here. This isn't what it's all about. And that's okay. It's okay to tell Jesus, to tell your parents, to tell your brothers and sisters, I'm not happy with this life. This isn't what it's all about. Jesus has something way better in store for us in heaven. And so sometimes as Christians, we're not going to be very happy with this life. And knowing that Jesus is not dead, but alive, changes everything. It even changes the way we complain because we know that our our lack of satisfaction here in this life will one day come to an end. When we leave this this life and, and join our God forever in heaven, where we will always be perfectly satisfied for all eternity, never complaining again. We're going to talk about this a lot more in our sermon today, and so I encourage you guys to pay pay special close attention as as we talk through what it looks like to complain as a Christian. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for coming to this world, not just to die, but to rise. You you did come into this life to to die on the cross, to, to pay the price that our sins deserve, we know you didn't stay dead. You, you rose from the dead. You, you came back to life. 
to watch over us each and every day, to prepare a place for us in heaven. When we struggle in this life and we face challenges, help us to keep our eyes fixed on the truth that your grave is empty, that you are alive, that you are preparing a place for us where we will never again be dissatisfied, where we will never again complain. We pray these things in your name, dear Savior. Amen. Hope to see you all soon. We'll continue with our hymn of the day. Let's pray. He lives to grant me rich supply. He lives to guide me with his eye. He lives to comfort me when faint. He lives to hear my soul's complaint. Amen.
I'm not sure how long you've been a Christian. Maybe some of you watching aren't Christians. I bet you've all at least heard of the hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. It's sung by Christians around the world every single year around Easter time. And in the fourth verse, there's this little line, he lives to hear my soul's complaint. Might be kind of a head scratcher at first as you listen to the words of that hymn. I think we can all understand how Jesus is dead and then he's alive. He's alive to grant me rich supply. He's alive to to watch over you and me and provide for us each and every day of our lives and forever in heaven. If he's dead, he can't do that. So he lives to provide for all we need. That makes sense. He lives to guide me with his eye. Makes sense also. A, A dead savior can't provide you and I with guidance in this life. He can't guide us forever in heaven. The fact that he's alive is helpful as he wants to guide us. Same thing with the comfort line. He, he lives to comfort me when faint. Again, if he's dead, he can't provide any comfort for you and for me. So he's got to be alive. But this last one, why would he come back to life to listen to me complain? What, what parent wants to wake up and get out of bed and first thing that day, Oh, yes, I'm alive another day. I get to hear my kids complain. Yeah, I don't think so, right? So so you're telling me Jesus stepped out of that tomb? He he lives to listen to me complain? How, How does that make sense? And on top of it all, how does complaining mesh with Christianity? There's this passage in the New Testament, in the book of 1 Timothy, that that says godliness with contentment is great gain. How do contentment and complaining go together? Those don't seem to to, to mesh. A standard dictionary definition for complaining or for complaint is an expression of dissatisfaction. That doesn't seem to mesh with contentment. How can you be expressing dissatisfaction while you're content? What did the hymn writer have in mind when he penned these famous lyrics? He lives to hear my soul's complaint. That's our goal for this morning, to better understand what the hymn writer meant with with those words. As we spend some time In an Old Testament book that's probably not all that familiar to you, the Old Testament book of Lamentations, we we read from chapter 3. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. This is the word of our God. Since this book of Lamentations is not the most well-known Old Testament book in the world, I wanted to spend a few minutes just giving you a little context. So we don't exactly know who, who wrote this boat, this book. We're, we're pretty sure. We're pretty confident that it was the prophet Jeremiah. And, and here's why. A couple hundred years before Jesus was born, a bunch of Jewish scholars began to translate the the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. Maybe you've heard of it. When this book was translated, those those translators bringing it into the Greek language gave this book a, a new name. 
They called it the tears of Jeremiah. Now, in, in Hebrew, the, old, the, the, the name of this book is, is derived from the first word in Hebrew, which is the word how. It really has nothing to do with Jeremiah. It has nothing to do with, with tears. But when the translators gave a name to this book in Greek, they called it the tears of Jeremiah. Obviously, they thought that it, that it was written by Jeremiah. When the book was later translated into Latin, it was given the name The Lamentations of Jeremiah. That's where we get our name from today, the Book of Lamentations. But, but even though tradition is strong, and it, and it does seem very likely that Jeremiah wrote this, we can't be 100% sure if it was Jeremiah or not. And so when I refer to the author today, I'll call him the Lamenting Prophet. I won't refer to him as Jeremiah. But, but we do know when this took place. The, the descriptions of this book make it very clear that this is taking place as Jerusalem is falling. And we know that that happened in 586 B.C., as King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon surrounded the city and destroyed it. We'll talk about that uh, again in a minute, but I first wanted to draw your attention to a warning, a, a very clear warning that God had given to his people as they were about to enter the promised land. So they had left Egypt about 40 years earlier, and they had wandered in the desert 40 years because they didn't trust God when he said they were going to take the land. God forced them to wander around in the desert for 40 years as punishment. None of the adults who left Egypt would get to go into the promised land. But as they're about to go in, God gives them a very clear warning. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8. He said, If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Couldn't really be any more clear than that. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read you the next promise the Lord made about disobedience, but maybe you could take a look at it yourself this week. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 28. God told his people before they entered the promised land that if they abandoned him, if they worshipped other gods instead of him, not only would they be destroyed, but he told them exactly what it would look like. It's found in Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 to 68. It's a very long section, very detailed section of what their destruction would look like. A horrifying scene, exactly mirroring what takes place in this book see what the prophet Jeremiah and, and what everybody else in Jerusalem experienced as King Nebuchadnezzar surrounded them was unbearable. Nebuchadnezzar had this strategy that, that he and his army would surround a city, cut off all the supply lines in and out, and just let the people starve to death. Instead of going into hand-to-hand -hand combat where, where bodies would be torn by by swords and all sorts of weapons. Rather than risk the life of his own soldiers, Nebuchadnezzar would surround the city and force the people inside to starve. He would protect the lives of his own soldiers and make things a whole lot simpler. It just took time. If you want to begin to understand just how awful it was inside of Jerusalem, read the rest of the book of Lamentations. It, it's short. It won't take you very long. The scene is horrendous. People are wasting away to skin and bones. They are so hungry that they imagine eating their dead relatives. It's a horrifying scene. It's hard to imagine how poor the quality of life for any one human being could be. But, but this scene in the book of Lamentations helps us to begin to understand just how awful life is can be. Uh, the prophet who, who writes this book, this, this lamenting prophet, he, he's complaining, you could say. He's expressing dissatisfaction with how awful life had become. Now, now we're going through a, a time in our lives that's challenging, to say the least, especially for us 21st century Americans who are used to our freedoms who are used to being able to go where we want to go, when we want to go there, 
who, who are used to being able to get just about anything at our disposal just about any time, a lot of that's been taken away from us right now. The letter of the law in our state says that if you don't live under the same roof, you can't go visit each other. So grandparents, if you don't live with your kids and your grandkids, you can't go to visit them. That's not fun. Maybe some of you grandparents have been complaining about not getting to see your grandbabies. If your business is deemed non-essential, you're not working right now. Who gets to decide what's non-essential anyway, you might be thinking to yourself. Perhaps you're complaining about that. If you're in college or in high school, you're not getting to experience what normal high school and college students have always been able to experience. A lot's been taken away from you, especially you seniors. Maybe the rest of you are, are enjoying some things about these changes. I hope that you've all begun to see some blessings in the change of pace, perhaps, time spent in your own household. But I don't think it's difficult for you and me to, to look at the challenges in this world right now, to, to see how, how difficult things can be. You know what it's like to complain. You know what it's like to, to have life turn a way that you weren't expecting it to turn. The question is, where's your complaint coming from? What kind of heart is your complaint flowing from? As we talked about in the children's devotion, it, is your heart a heart that knows and believes that Jesus is alive? Or does your heart forget that from time to time? I think pretty much everyone alive today knows deep down that, that Christians believe that God became a man. I think just about everyone knows that, that Christians believe that God's own son came into this world to sacrifice himself for you, and for me, I think everyone in the world knows that Christians believe he, he didn't stay dead, but, but rose from the dead. That's celebrated every single year on Easter Sunday. But is it head knowledge that knows what Christians believe about Jesus? Or is it actual trust that these things happened? If Jesus really is God's Son, if Jesus really came into this world to sacrifice himself for the sins of the whole world, if Jesus really rose from the dead, then no matter what happens in this life, you have hope. You have hope of an eternity in heaven. And this morning, what we're looking at is someone who was looking forward to those promises of God. Not someone who was looking back like you and me, but someone who was looking forward. Someone who lived at a time when God's son had not yet been born, when he had not yet been sacrificed for the sins of the world, when he had not yet risen from the dead. Someone who looked ahead and knew God's promises and therefore knew he had hope even in the most unthinkable of situations. Listen to what he says once again. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This lamenting prophet, even though the world around him was unthinkably awful, knew that he had hope because he had the faithful God who makes promises and keeps them, whose, whose love is, is renewed day after day. Why? Because he had promised a Messiah. 
because he had promised to send someone who would fix the problem of sin in the world, who would fix the problem of death in the world, and who would grant eternal life to all who believed in him. This lamenting prophet knew that and he believed that, even though the the, the Savior had not yet come. He, He knew that the Lord's great love was something that would give him hope. Jesus has demonstrated the Lord's great love for us in the simple fact that he came to this earth to live the perfect life that we fail to live, to suffer the punishment, the hell that we deserve for our sins, to die, but not to stay dead to show us that our sins had so fully been paid for that even their greatest consequence, death itself, had been completely defeated. He rose. He rose from the dead. He lives. And yes, he even lives to hear your soul's complaint, to listen to you come to him and tell him how challenging life has been for you lately, to tell him that you're not satisfied with things here that you're looking forward to what he has won for you in heaven. This lamenting prophet goes on. He says, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The Lord is my portion. He's my inheritance. He's all that I need As long as I have the Lord and his promises, I have hope. I have salvation waiting for me in heaven. That's really good for us to remember, especially during these challenging times, especially if you are are particularly suffering, going through unique challenges based on your lot in life. I want to talk to two groups of seniors real quick. I mentioned you earlier. Maybe you're the kind of senior who's home alone because your spouse has passed away recently. You're not getting to spend much time with other people. You miss your your church family probably as much as anyone because here is a place where you have relationships. Here is a place where you have family, brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and you really miss seeing your brothers and sisters in Christ. And on top of it all, you, you can't even see your immediate family, your grandkids, your your relatives. That They can't come to visit right now either. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, this is a a rotten deal. All all those grandparents who have come before me, decades and decades worth of grandparents who who aren't here on this earth anymore, they all got to see their grandkids when they wanted to. They got to go to church when they wanted to. Why me? Why now? Why is this happening now? Why couldn't this have happened a few years ago while my spouse was still alive? Why couldn't this have happened a, a few years ago? When I had more people living in my house, why now? Why when I'm alone? My heart goes out to you. I miss you. I hope to see you again soon. We all do. But remember what this lamenting prophet says here. Even when your earthly portion seems to be a touch of a ripoff, you have the Lord as your portion. You have the Lord as your inheritance. And you don't have to wait patiently for the salvation of the Lord because the salvation of the Lord has already come. You know God's Son. You know what He came to do for you. You know that His sacrifice on the cross means your sins are forgiven and you know that His resurrection means this world is not all there is. There's an eternal existence where you will really live without complaint, perfectly satisfied for all eternity. Keep your eyes focused on that prize. And to you other seniors, those of you who are seniors in college or seniors in high school, boy, you're missing out on a lot. I can only imagine how much your, your heart is agonizing over what you looked forward to What you've seen class after class after class of seniors enjoy, you don't get to enjoy. You just want to be with your friends right now. You just want to claim any semblance of a normal senior year. You're supposed to be celebrating right now, getting ready for a graduation in mere weeks. 
but nothing. You eighth graders too, this is supposed to be a big time in your life. This is supposed to be a time when you get to celebrate the end of a long chapter in your life and moving on to, to another one. Maybe you think the portion that you're being served isn't fair. It's not like the portion last year's eighth graders got. It's not like the portion last year's high school seniors or last year's college seniors got. Why you? Why, why now? It's okay to go to the Lord and, and complain about your portion here on earth. It's okay to go to the Lord and to tell him you're dissatisfied with what you have here. Just remember to be satisfied with the Lord. Remember to be satisfied with the portion that is God and his promises of eternal peace, eternal satisfaction. You and I have everything we need in Jesus. Our bank accounts may shrink. We may lose jobs. We may lose our freedoms. We may lose so much that we love about this place. We may have every reason to be dissatisfied here. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on the eternal satisfaction that awaits you in heaven. Remember, Jesus lives even to hear your soul's complaint. Amen. How blessed are they who hear God's word And keep and heed what they have heard They daily grow in wisdom Their light shines brighter day by day And while they tread life's weary way They have the oil of gladness to soothe their pain and sadness God's word a treasure is to me Through sorrows and night my son shall be The shield of faith in battle The Father's hand has written there My title as His child and dear The kingdom's yours forever This promise fails me never
How blessed are they who hear God's word and keep and heed what they have heard. They daily grow in wisdom. We join together in our confession of faith. Living in a world where people believe that the universe was formed through chance and accident, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And living in a world where people are confronted with the guilt and punishment of sin, what do you believe Jesus did for you? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And living in a world where people are without hope and certainty, what do you believe? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we will continue our worship service with the prayer of the church followed by the Lord's Prayer. As always, we we pray these prayers on behalf of this congregation here in this little corner of God's kingdom, also on behalf of God's church throughout the world. We pray. O Lord God, our strength, our song, and our salvation, you fulfilled your promises by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. Thanks be to God. You give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In your compassion, you sent Christ, the good and now living shepherd, who laid down his life to rescue the lost. Drive out all doubt and gloom that we may delight in your glorious victory. Lift our eyes heavenward to see him who lives to make intercession for the saints and grant us confidence in his great power. Keep before our eyes the vision of your redeemed people standing before your throne and singing the song of victory. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Make us instruments of your peace as we bring the good news of hope and new life to those around us. Guide us in the use of all that you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Risen Lord, live in us that we may live for you. Merciful Lord Jesus, grant healing to the sick and strengthen the faith of the suffering and the dying. Assure them of your abiding presence and comfort them with the hope of eternal life. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, you have restored to us the joy of your salvation. With happy hearts, we come before you and say, Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Father, we bring these prayers before you confident that you will hear and answer them. For it was your only Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close with our final hymn, Lord of all hopefulness. 
You, you, you've noticed that many of the recordings that we've been using have been from different sources the last few weeks. Um, this is another recording of, of this beautiful hymn sung by a number of people in our church body. Um, you'll notice that in this particular recording, the men will sing verse 1, the women verse 2, everyone sings verse 3, and then the choir sings verse 4. Of course, as always, you are welcome to join in any verse that, that you want. We'll sing the hymn together. Good morning to you all. Welcome once again to Mount Olive. So glad you could join us for worship this morning. And we do pray that the Lord blessed your worship with us. My wife and I were joking around after worship last week because right about now I, I had said to you, I don't really have any announcements for today. And then I went on to give you like five different announcements. I, I really just have, have one today and I'll try to keep it to just that one. I mentioned it earlier um, after the confession of faith when we normally would give our offering here at Mount Olive that online giving is now available. It is set up and, and functioning properly. You'll find it on our website in the top right corner. There's a little button that says giving. You can click on that button. It'll take you to our, our giving page. Um, the best instructions I can give you if you want to go that route is look for the little silhouette of a person in the upper right-hand corner of that giving screen. There'll be a little head and shoulders. If you click that, it'll give you the opportunity to, to create an account. And once you've created an account, you can do sorts of, all sorts of things like set up recurring donations. You can link a bank account. Um, all sorts of things you can set up once you've created an account. It is possible to give without creating an account, um, but you won't be able to give with a bank account, only with a credit or debit card. If you have any questions with this new system, we anticipate there being all sorts of questions. You can feel free to reach out to, to Roger Cohn or myself at any time. We'd be happy to help you better understand how the system works. With that, Lord's blessings to you all this week as you bask in the glow of the hope that we share, the hope of an eternity in heaven. Lord's blessings to you all.